Um, you want to turn to the first chapter of the book of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 1. We're going to be take, take a look at verses 35 through 39. Now as you, uh, as you undoubtedly remember, I'm sure you remember, I'm hoping you remember, uh, I had somebody a couple weeks ago said, what was it we preached last week? And they looked at me and I said, look, most church people don't remember what you preach from one week to the next, let alone the preacher. Uh, so I'm hoping that you remember that we've been talking about what a church is. And we've talked about the idea, we've seen from the Bible, that the church is a group of people that share a common faith in Jesus Christ. A group of people that have been endowed with his authority, have been given the keys uh, of the kingdom of heaven, and have been called to follow him. So we launched out from that, and we took a look at Jesus and said, well, what were some of the things that Jesus did? And we talked about how that he, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he did service we saw last week. We've seen some other things that he did. And I, 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 I want you, I, I should have warned you ahead of time. I want you to be aware that this list is in no priority at all. You know, I, these, are, these are just the things that, as they came to mind, that I kind of listed them out. So don't go, oh, number one, number two, number three, number four. This is no priority because today we, we come to the issue of Orison. Now, y'all are familiar with what Orison is, right? Oh, come on. Being believers and everything, I was sure that you would know what Orison is. He's that guy that did that. That radio show in the 30s, no, that's, no, that's not him. Orson Welles, exactly. Uh, Roy Orison, yes. Uh, no, Orison is an old English word for prayer. But the reason that I chose an old English word is because far too often, prayer has taken on a life of its own. If I were just to say, we're going to talk about prayer, I can almost guarantee, and I mean you no disrespect, but I can almost guarantee that you would kind of go click and turn off. Because everybody knows what prayer is. Everybody understands what prayer is. Everybody says, well, yeah, Jesus prayed. We should pray. Move on. Next issue. But I'll tell you what, there are there are a lot of opinions about what prayer is. I had somebody email me this week a question. They said, uh, when the Mormons pray to God, are they praying to the same God that we are? And I said, well, if you ask a Mormon, they would say yes. But if you look at what Mormons believe about El, who they believe is God's name, then the answer is no. Because they believe about El, God, that he is a man of flesh and bone, that through good work and perseverance, elevated himself to Godhood. And that you can, if you're a guy, do the same. Now, is that the same God revealed in Scripture? No. no. So even though they use the word God, and we use the word God, we're not talking about the same thing. The same happens with prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me, I picked up a little bit of a cold. I imported a cold, how about that, from California. And they didn't ask me at the fruit inspection station either. You know, you're bringing a cold back with you, yes, can I leave it over there? They didn't ask me. When you... When you when you sit down and get past the terminology with people, if you can find some way to talk about prayer without using the word prayer, or if you were to say to them, do you pray? And they go, yes, I pray. And then you were to follow that up with, well, what do you mean by prayer? You're going to find some pretty varying answers. You're going to find from some people that, that, that prayer is a formula. Yes, I pray, and I pray the Hail Marys, or I pray the Our Fathers, or I pray the Lord's Prayer. And, and in their mind, that is all that prayer is. It's, it's kind of like a recipe. 
You know, you go to God and you pray these certain program prayers. If you want this, you pray this. If you've done that, you pray this. If you do these, you pray those. So prayer is a formula. And you don't deviate from that prayer. And, you know, you go, wow, as Baptists, I'm so glad that we're not that way. Really? Try praying without saying in Jesus' name. And find out how condemned you feel. Well, I've got to say in Jesus' name, because if I don't say in Jesus' name, God doesn't hear me. As a matter of fact, I had somebody tell me that one time. Well, if you don't say in Jesus' name, then God doesn't hear you. I went, really? I mean, it's kind of like the stamp on the envelope. And, it, and you put it in the mailbox. If it doesn't got a stamp, it doesn't go. If I don't say in Jesus' name, then my prayer somehow doesn't get to the ears of God. Well, that looks at prayer as a formula. I've got, to, I've got to do it a certain way, and I can't deviate from that. So you say to some folks, what do you pray? And they'll go, yes, I, I pray this, this prayer, the old Englishman's prayer, or the prayer of this, or the prayer of that. I had an instructor in school who had a, 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 he was Presbyterian, and he had a book of prayers. And that was the first I ever encountered a of, of book of prayers, and I kind of thought that was strange. How do you pray somebody else's prayer? And, and now understand... I'm not saying that it's, that it's not appropriate at times to pray like the Lord's Prayer or somebody else's prayer, if that conveys your heart. But just to say that I have signed, sealed, and delivered by doing some sort of formula, that's not prayer. Okay? Matter of fact, Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 6, yes. there it is. He, he taught out of Matthew 6 this morning. He says, don't use vain repetition. Don't, don't think just because of the way that you speak that you're going to be heard. Prayer is not formula. Some people look at prayer as magic. As magic. That in order to, to get some, some desired outcome, I'll pray a prayer. So, you know, I, gentlemen, I, 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 I want to I make, make par on this hole. So I stand there and I, and I, I pray. You know, and, and if I pray, then God will help my ball magically find the hole. Okay? Or I want this to happen. Or I want that to happen. Or I don't want this to happen. Or I don't want that to happen. And so therefore, you know, I, you have to pray in order for that outcome to happen. Well, I'm telling you, that is not prayer. Okay? It's kind of like, it's kind of like when you, you go to bed at night. And you have a routine that you do. You know, guys, they, they, they patrol the perimeter, check all the doors, all the windows, you know, all of that stuff. You got a routine? And, you know, you, you could have done it an hour before. But right before you go to bed is when you got to do it. So right before you go, doesn't matter. You've done it already. Wife says, honey, you did it already. I, I locked it up. It's okay. You still got to do it, right? right? Anybody there? That's magic. Because if I don't, then something might happen. Actually, that's called OCD. <laughs> Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Okay? Used to be, I, I always had to pray before we traveled. Because if I didn't pray, then the car would break down. Now, is that rational? No, that's not rational. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pray to affect things. But when we feel we have to pray in order for things to happen or not happen, then we view prayer as being magic. Because I did this prayer, you know, this, this outcome happened. Some people look at prayer as universal. They see every prayer from every person as being valid. Matter of fact, I'll get emails sometimes. People will say, you know, my, my dog's got arthritis and we pray for him. And, you know, of course I'll pray for your dog. I pray for my dogs. I appreciate your prayer for my dogs because they're heathens and they need it. Okay? <laughs> and, and, they, and, and they'll say sometimes, oh, I've got people all over the United States praying for me and I don't care what they believe, you know, all prayer is good. No, it's not. There are some people I do not want praying for me. You understand that? There are some people I do not want praying for me. I do not want people praying for me who are praying to a God of not, that is not of the Scripture. Because if they're not praying to the God of Scripture, to whom are they praying? Well, at the very least, the answer is no one. So then I don't want them wasting their time. 
at the worst, they're praying to a devil. And I don't want that prayer. So there, I, I mean, I, I, I know that sounds kind of harsh to say sometimes. But I don't want a Buddhist praying for me. I don't want a Mormon praying for me. I don't want a Jehovah's Witness praying for me. Now, if you know friends that are Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and you think that I believe they're not Christians, ding, 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 they're not. And I don't want them praying for me. I don't want a Satanist praying for me. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. Yes. All prayer is not the same. Amen. It's not like any cell phone, you know, ties into any tower. There are some prayers that God doesn't get. And I don't want those prayers. So if somebody says to me, you know, I'm a, I'm a wicked, and I'm going to pray to the God of nature that you get healed, thank you, but no. I don't want that prayer. Because see, you understand the unspoken concept in that is that the efficacy or the power, the effectiveness is in the prayer. And that's wrong. The efficacy, the effectiveness, the, 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 that which makes the difference is not in the act of prayer. But if we view all prayer as legitimate, then we're putting the emphasis on the prayer. There are those of you prayer, and this is usually out of Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhism, that sort of thing, that view prayer as a path to enlightenment. You know, you see them sitting around and they go, oh. You know? Oh. What's that, the incredible Mr. Limpet, where he had that sound? Oh. That's what I always think about. They're not talking to anybody. They're just kind of sitting there opening themselves up to the universe. To be enlightened. Well, that's no prayer. So you see, when you go and talk to people and you tell people that, you know, I pray and they go, well, I pray too. You may not be talking about the same thing. You might be talking about prayer from a God-revealed biblical perspective. You might be talking about prayer from a theological, ecclesiastical tradition they may be talking about prayer from a humanistic, human-centered, human-divined uh, understanding. And so you all are using the same word, but it's like calling a dog a cat. You go, yeah, I've got a dog. And they go, well, i got a dog too. What's your dog's name? My dog is Fido. What's your dog's name? Fifi. Oh, that's great. My dog barks all the time. Yeah, mind me house. And you go, wait a minute. Well, maybe they've got a strange dog. There's a lot of different understandings about what prayer is. And we need to, we need to understand what prayer is. Oswald Chambers says in his excellent work on prayer, uh, it's called Prayer Holy Occupation. He says a lot of us want to be active about the kingdom work. And he says, you know what the kingdom work is? The kingdom work is prayer. So it's important that we understand what prayer is. And I think no better place to go for a reference to prayer is to the life of Jesus. And so that's why we're here in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. Because we find Jesus praying. Now, I'm going to ask you to please suspend your preoccupation, your preconceptions, and try to read this passage as though you've never read it before, which will be no problem for Jerry, because he's never read the Bible. Okay? You know, he's awake. All right, good. I just want to make sure. Suspend any, you know, as you're reading this, go, oh, this is, try not to do that. Okay? Try to approach, it, approach this as new territory. Because Jesus has something to teach us about prayer in this passage. Beginning in verse uh, 35, it says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, <laughs> the oxymoron in the early morning, it's still dark, unless you're in, you know, Alaska or the Poles, Early morning is usually dark, you know. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and he went away to a secluded place and was praying there. And Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go somewhere else uh, to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into the synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Now, did you get the joke in there? There's a, there's a really hilarious interchange there. 
It says that Jesus got up early in the morning before the sun came up to go and pray. Now, relax, relax, relax. I'm not going to tell you that you got to get up before the sun shines to pray. I had somebody tell me that as a young man. The only problem is, if I see the sun come up and I see the sun go down, it's been a long day, okay? And I've tried this. I've gotten up early in the morning before the sun comes up, and I've gone into my, into my place to pray, and I've, I've, I've read my Bible, and I bowed my head, and I went right back to sleep. <laughs> okay? Dear Lord. I mean, I, I've done that. I am not a morning person. If you're up before the sun shines, you are a sick individual. I'm just <laughs> telling you that. All right? You guys give me a hard time. You go, oh, I was up at 5 o'clock. Look, keep your problems to yourself. Okay? I'm up at midnight. All right? I'm a night owl. I do my best work after the sun goes down. All right? Have that men's breakfast. Where's Jerry at? Where's he? Well, not Jerry. Dennis. Where's Dennis? Dennis not here? Oh, I'm picking on Dennis. Oh, there he is. Dennis always gave me a hard time about men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. Dude, the house has got to be on fire to get me out of bed before 7. All right? Now, look, if you want to get up early, God bless you. He's wired you that way. That's great. But don't put me down in the kingdom for not being that way. All right? I've, I've tried it. I get up early in the morning, and I go right back to sleep. Now, my wife, she loves me. She tries to make me feel good. She says, well, what better place to fall asleep than in the arms of Jesus? Yeah, but I, I, I don't get to pray. I'm sleeping. And, and, and I've had people go, well, look here. You know, Jesus got up early in the morning to pray. And you ought to get up early in the morning to pray. Now, if you subscribe to that thought, then you view prayer as a formula. Well, Jesus did it. I've got to do it. Well, you know what? If Dennis gets up early in the morning to pray, I'm really glad Dennis gets up early in the morning to pray. Dennis is a morning guy. So, great. I'm not a morning guy. All right? So, maybe I ought to get on Dennis because he doesn't pray at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, yeah, what sort of Christian are you? He says, well, I try to pray at 11 o'clock at night and I fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> in the arms of Jesus. You're right, brother. Okay? So, I mean, <clears throat> if you view that you've got to do it at a certain time, then you have accepted that prayer is a formula. Prayer is not a formula. This is not saying to you that you have to get up early in the morning to pray. I can tell you by experience, God is a morning person and a night person. He's there whenever, right? So what is this really saying? You understand that Jesus getting up before anything else. Because notice what it says after that. Jesus went off to a secluded place and was praying. And then his disciples came and tracked him down. I want you to, I want you to understand what this passage is saying. It's saying that Jesus got away from everybody. He went and hid from them. He got up early in the morning because they were still asleep. They were me. Okay? <laughs> And they were still in bed and Jesus got away to be alone, to be away from them. He went and hid from them before they left anywhere. This is Jesus' attempt to honor God by making him the first thing of his day. Remember what the, the first commandment says over in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3? You shall have no other gods before me, right? I'm Lord your God. I'm supposed to be number one. This is Jesus' manifestation of that truth. He's saying, God is number one to me. Before I talk to the disciples, before I hit about the synagogues, before I go meet with the crowds, before I do anything, I go and spend time with God. I anchor my day with God. That's what he's doing before the disciples got up and started asking him questions, before he encountered the crowds, before he went to those nearby towns, before he got busy healing the sick and casting out demons, before he did anything, Jesus went and spent time with God. He, he established himself before God before anything else. So, if Jesus' day started at 10, getting up early might be 8. 
If his day doesn't start till 2, getting up early might be 12. You see what I'm saying? Let's go back over it again because obviously you die. <laughs> I mean, really think about this. If you work swing shift or you work graveyard shift and you get up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because you work at 11 o'clock at night, what are you supposed to do? Get up at 6 in the morning or 5 in the morning? Shoot, you're still at work. So you get up early before anything else that goes on in the course of your day. If your day starts at 10, you start your day off with the Lord before 10. You don't stay in bed until right before you got to do it. You anchor yourself with God. Because I'll tell you, this is what happens to me. I'm sure it happens to you as well. You get out of bed, you've got all these great intentions, you go and take a shower, you do what you got to do, and then slowly your day begins to creep in, right? You got to do this, you got to do that, and you got to check this, and oh, what about that? And before you know it, you're in the midst of your day, and you've had no time with God. And you go, oh, no big deal, I'll catch before I go to bed. The deal is this, your day is now going to shape you. You're, you're not going to allow you to be shaped by your time with God. You are not going to encounter your day in light of the Lord. You're going to interpret the Lord in light of your day. Jesus sat down and said, before anything else touches my life, I want to spend time with God. And it was essential that he did that. You read down a little bit further, and I've already alluded to it, said he went, by, went to the nearby towns, he preached the gospel, he cast out demons. You think maybe you need to pray? You think maybe there's something going on that you might need to pray? Well, shoot, no. Jesus was good. He didn't need to pray. All you instrumentalists and singers, I really appreciate the blessing that you've been. I enjoyed the music this morning. You guys are doing a great job. But you practice, don't you? Yep. Why do you practice? Good question. Well, <laughs> yeah, good question. I understand that one. You know, it's like, look, wait a minute. Things don't just happen. I mean, sometimes they do. Sometimes you get caught unaware and, and you don't have time to prepare. But most of the times we prepare. You understand that, 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 that to do a message on Sunday morning, I don't wait until the offering and say, all right, Lord, you know, what do you want preached? There's a joke amongst preachers that they're debating about, you know, how they, they do their sermon prep. And one guy, you know, he says, yeah, Friday nights, you know, I'm in there cramming it out. And another guy sitting there, he says, Saturday afternoons, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. Third guy's quiet. And they look at him and say, what's up with you? He goes, I'm trying to figure out what you guys do in the year off to our prayer. You know, we don't just wait and go, okay, God, all right, great. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes in the middle of something, God opens an opportunity to share and there is no preparation, if you will, and all of a sudden it goes forth. But there are other times when God says, you know this is coming, you need to prepare. Prayer is preparation. If we're going to start our day, we know what's coming up sometimes. Jesus knew what was before him. That's why the narrative tells him that, that tells us that they're getting ready to go out. So Jesus said, I know this is coming up. I need prayer. I need to spend time with God. So if you're going to start your day and you're going to say to God, you know what, Lord, I really want you to bless my day, but you're not going to spend time with him, then I got to kind of wonder what's going through your mind. So Jesus said, you know what? I want to honor God in my life. I want him to be number one. So before I do anything else, I'm going to spend time with him. So he got up early in the morning to pray. The other thing that tells us is he went away to a secluded place. He went he prayed by himself. Now I'm not trying to tell you that corporate prayer is ineffective. You understand what I mean by corporate prayer? Prayer in a group. Prayer more than one person. Okay, Jesus prayed in groups. Jesus prayed out loud. Jesus prayed in front of people. But Jesus prayed alone. Jesus got away from the crowds. Got away from the people. Got away from everything else. Matter of fact, oftentimes he would tell us he'd go off onto a mountain and he'd, he'd, he'd you know, just really get away from folks. 
In Matthew 6, He calls this the inner room where it's just you and God. You need that. Because prayer is not, hear me, prayer is not something visible. Prayer isn't the position of the body. Prayer isn't the, the words that you use. Oh, they pray so, they pray so beautifully. Our Father is with artith in heaven. And <laughs> hallowed be it thy name. Is. I, God's going like this. <laughs> Say you good? Prayer is not what we tend to emphasize on, which is that external aspect. How do I know that? Because nobody saw Jesus praying. <laughs> prayer is communion between an individual and God. I'm telling you right now, understand me on this, please. If you don't encounter God, you haven't prayed. I don't care how long you've done it. I don't care what words you've used. I don't care if you've raised your hands, laid on your face, danced around. I don't care what you've done. If you've not encountered God, if you've not run into Him face to face, you've not prayed. Now that's a big statement to make. Because then i got to look at my life and i got to all of a sudden look at these episodes of prayer and I've got to say if I encountered God if I have not encountered God then there might be a problem now I believe there are times that we encounter God and we're unaware of it because some of my greatest prayers sound something like this <laughs> you with me? it's like oh! And the Bible tells us that. The Spirit makes intercession for our groanings that we don't have words for. And there are times that I am so in the barrel with the monkey and the snot flying that I just, I, God could be right there and I'm going to miss Him. But then there are other times that I go into prayer and all I'm focused on is what I'm trying to get or how I'm trying to manipulate God. Let's be honest. Don't we try to manipulate God? Oh God, you know got this job interview coming up. I want, I want you to give me this job. Oh God, I've got this medical test coming up. I want it to be good. And we're trying to get God to do what we want. And God's going uh, 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 and we're talking the whole time. And we've never encountered God and we come away going, oh man, that was such a good prayer time. Really? God had a lot to say. And you never listened. Jesus went alone to be with God. Nobody saw him. Matter of fact, they had to go dig for him to find him. They searched for him, it says in verse 36. And he's not there. He's not there. Where, where could he have gone? He went and beat every bush and they found him. He's like, look, I'm trying to be alone with the Lord. Prayer is when a person comes into communion with God. And it's not more prayer if your prayer is answered. And it's not less prayer if your prayer is an answer. It's just enough that you've been in the presence of God. And Jesus, Jesus needed that. Before the crucifixion, Christ prayed that, that you and I, that His disciples, would be one, even as He and the Father are one. You, you remember that? How do you think, how do you think He experienced that oneness? By being with God. Prayer. It's an opportunity for a person to encounter God. God's not dead. How do you know? I spoke to Him. I experienced Him. I touched Him. He touched me. You know the best part of my vacation this week? I got to see the Reagan. That was cool. Got to see the Carl Benson. That was cool. Got to see the Midway. That was cool. Yeah, aircraft carriers. Got to see some stuff in the astronomy at the Griffith Observatory. Really cool. Nah, got to spend time with my wife. That was really cool. And you know what? We didn't do anything sometimes. We just, you know, sat at the beach. Our deal when we go there, every night we go out to Coronado Island. And, and fantasize about staying at the Hotel Dell. And we sat on their porch. 
and that's as close as we get. Listen to the music, maybe we get a little Starbucks or something, and it's like, oh, we're here. <laughs> I get to spend time with her. Why can't you feel that way about God? That's what prayer is. I, I, I may not have done anything, but I've come into, I've come into communion with God. That is what prayer is. It's not how long we pray. It's not how short we pray. It's not whether or not our prayers are answered. It's not about whether or not we get what we want. It's not about whether we've prayed the right way. It's that we come away from that time knowing that we have been in the presence of God. Listen to this. It's Jesus again out of Matthew 6. When you pray, go into your inner room. Be alone with God. Close the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Everything that we think of coming from prayer really is the result of encountering God. I had a guy one, one time. He was a Vietnam vet. And I asked him the most powerful weapon he ever handled. And he said, a handheld radio. I went, what? He said, yeah, with that I could order air support, offshore bombardment, artillery. It's a great, great weapon. I'm thinking you grab it by the antenna and you beat him over the head. <laughs> the radio wasn't what was powerful. It's what the radio tied into. Prayer is not what is powerful. It's who it ties into. Yeah. There is no prayer of healing. There is no prayer of deliverance. There is no prayer of salvation. Those, that thought puts the emphasis on the prayer and makes it a formula. Well, did I pray the prayer of deliverance right? They didn't get delivered. Did I pray the prayer of healing right? There is no prayer of you fill in the blank. Because prayer is not powerful in and of itself. Prayer is powerful because of who we pray to. God delivers. God heals. God saves. In response to the heart that is open before Him. That is prayer. When I come into the very presence of God and I lay my life before Him as He lays Himself before me and we interact and we encounter one another. It is communion. It is communion with God where I, where I come to understand Him. You, under, you, 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 you realize... I'm not saying that you can understand all that God is. But you can understand Him as He reveals Himself. And how is that supposed to happen? As I spend time with Him. When I'm in communion with God, I lean into Him. I'm, in, I'm enraptured by Him. And, and the, the struggle that I'm looking to Him for deliverance from, I find in His presence. It's in prayer that I come before Him and, and, and I'm changed. Where maybe the situation stays the same, but I'm different. It's in prayer that, that I ask those questions and that by His mercy He might give it. But whatever the case, I'm okay because I've encountered God. That's what we learned from Jesus. Prayer is not what you do. It's a state in which you are in. Listen again to what Jesus said in the book of John, the 11th chapter. Now this is at the raising of Lazarus, if you are familiar with that passage. And before he does anything, he says this. He says, he lifted his eyes and he said, Father... I thank you that, have heard, that, you, that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. Now, if you read the passage, an interesting thing is not noted. 
Nowhere in there does he pray. It says that Mary and Martha sent for him and he shows up and he comes up and he says, well, where have they laid him? And they said, well, he's over here. And he says, well, roll back the stone. And they said, well, Lord, he is odiferous. He smells. Nowhere does it say anything about him praying. Nowhere does it say he went over into the corner and he got down on his hands and knees. He crossed himself. He did this. He did. Nowhere does it say it. Until Jesus opens his mouth and he says, God, thanks for hearing me. You know what 1 Thessalonians tells us? Amongst other things, pray always. Pray always. Never stop praying. Never cease to be in a state of communion with God. So whether you see Jesus off in the corner praying or not, it's obvious that he's praying and he says, Father, thanks for hearing me. He says, but then again, I know that you always hear me, but because the people are standing around, I said this so that they might believe you sent me. Jesus lived in a state of prayer. When he was walking, when he was talking, when he was sitting down, when he was rising up. First thing in the morning, last thing at night, he lived in a state of prayer. Is that your concept of prayer? Or is your concept of prayer divorced from God? I pray, it goes to God, and God answers. Or doesn't answer. Or do you understand that prayer is being in the presence of God? Of encountering God? Now let me tell you one important aspect about prayer. Prayer is grounded in a relationship. Okay? Remember when they asked Jesus, well, teach us how to pray, and what's the first thing he said in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who is in heaven. Our Father. Doesn't say God, big guy, any of that. Use his word of relationship. Our Father. Relationship undergirds prayer. If you don't have a relationship with God, it's hard for you to commune with God. It's not hard for you to pray. You can pray. And I'm not saying that it's impossible for God to answer because God can do anything. When I was out of relationship with God, there were times that he answered my prayers. I know that. I know for most definitely that he answered my prayer of salvation. You ever think about that? Some people say, well, God doesn't hear the prayers of the unbelieving. Well, then how do you get saved? <laughs> but you cannot commune with God if you do not have a relationship. So if you're here this morning and you've never asked God into your life, surrendered yourself to him, then prayer is going to be something completely different for you. It's going to be a hit and miss thing as you bump into God. Although I would ask you if you're not in relationship with God, why are you praying anyway? Maybe you realize you need His help. How about making a relationship? But if you're in a relationship with God, I hope that you look at prayer a little bit differently. I hope there are times you fall on your face before God. I hope there are times you kneel before God. I hope that you know there are times just in the course of your day that you talk to God. But I hope that whatever the mode, the method, however you go at it, I hope you understand that prayer is about encountering God. And that you will not be satisfied with anything less than encountering God. And that you will tarry in prayer until you encounter God. Because it's only when you encounter God that prayer changes things. Father, we want to be a praying people. Not because there's something significant about prayer in and of itself, but because of the fact that prayer is coming into your presence. And we, we desperately need to encounter you. Help us, Father, to, to jettison that concept of prayer that is different than what we see in the life of our master. Help us to strive to yearn for a, an expression, an experience of prayer 
that that is more biblical, that is that that is more in line with Jesus, that we might discover the richness of prayer. And Father, if there's someone here that does not have a relationship with you, I would pray that you would please speak to their heart. That you would reveal yourself to them. They would give themselves to you and experience the fullness of your presence. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. We just love you so much. Amen.